Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin, the bulls versus the bears. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. We now are launching a sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium, so if you have been waiting to sign up, now would be a good time for you to do so. We, of course, do have several different tiers. You can lock in the rate that's offered. Make sure you check it out. Links in the description below or at intothecryptoverse.com. Let's go ahead and jump in. This video series is something that we carry out approximately once a quarter or so. The reason I don't do it more frequently is because in the grand scheme of things, every single indicator that we look at isn't going to see a significant change from one week to another, generally speaking. Of course, there are some weeks that could lead to a change in what an indicator might suggest. But over the long haul, over the macro scale, you're not going to see a ton of changes in this. And so I find it most prudent to update this video series approximately once per quarter. Now, there's a couple caveats to this series that I, I like to just go ahead and get out of the way. First of all, it's not financial advice. All right, you guys know that, you should know that. Second of all, there's more of a specific question that we're trying to ask here, okay? Because in the grand scheme of things, if you were to look at most cyclical indicators for Bitcoin, they're going to suggest either the bottom is in or it's, it's, you know, it's within eyesight, right? Like if it's not in, which we're going we're, we're gonna to address in some of the indicators, then how much lower could it be is sort of the, the question. So from a sort of like from a, a 30,000 foot view, most indicators, especially the on-chain indicators, are, are, are going to lean uh, more in the bullish, bullish direction. But what we more so want to do is compare sort of the depths of prior bear markets to try to get a sense as to does the indicator suggest that the bottom is in? OK, because there's a difference between, you know, is it a good buy with, say, if you're looking forward two years versus is the bottom in or not based on this indicator? So that's what I that's really the fundamental question that I, I want to at least attempt to answer. Unfortunately, there's no black and white way to do this. It, it's all about probabilities. It's all about which indicators you put you put the most value into, one of which should probably be just the Federal Reserve. But we're going to go through this systematically now. In every video series, I always think it's a good idea to, to figure out where we came from so as to you know make sure we stay on top of that. And I, I believe the first video that I did for this series was back in the summer of 2021. And, and this was back when I wasn't really sure if we were going to go back above the bull market support band. Um, I was certainly cheering for it and I, I wanted Bitcoin to go to new highs. But you know me, I'm, you know, I... I will always talk about the downside risk. And, and we sort of drew out a potential path where you get rejected and, and then you just sort of come back down at the, to these lower valuations down here. Now, ultimately, we know this is not what happened, right? I mean, it's hard to know it at the time, but we ended up going and putting in a double top, okay? So a double, a double top came and, and then we ended up going back down to actually some of the same levels that we suggested, but it was above the bull market support band. And then once it broke to new highs, it didn't really go that much higher. Okay, so this was sort of the first video in the series. The second video was this one. And this was back when Bitcoin was at 40K and we were noting that, hey, you know, we didn't get rejected here, but it seems like it, it could be a possibility here. Uh, and if it is, what are the implications of that? Now, this video was about a year ago. Okay, again, when Bitcoin was about 40K, here's another video that we did about seven months ago. And at this point, what we were really looking at was comparing this bear market to the prior bear markets in terms of length. Now, if you think back to this one, uh, this um, bear versus bull case occurred after this, you know, after this primary capitulation in June. And, and this was sort of that June bottom that a lot of people were speculating was the bottom. But we were like, look, guys, history shows us that we normally do get another dump right, eventually, especially as you get into the end of the year. And we talked about how and oftentimes in Q3, you will see a rally. We saw a rally in 2018 in Q3. We saw a rally in Q3 in 2022. Um, but it didn't mean the bottom was in, right? It, it, it did not mean that. And so that's what we talked about um, you know, about seven months ago. And then the last video I, I think we did in the series was about four months ago. And, and it was when Bitcoin was at around 21K. And one of the things that we talked about in that video was that 
the primary issue was again the idea of hey is this really low enough to justify a major market cycle bottom right is it low enough and you you guys know my general stance has been that it wasn't right like that we haven't gone lower enough and and ultimately you can see that that bitcoin and we did get that that capitulation in november but the question that we have to ask ourselves is was it enough right is it enough what do the indicators tell us all right now if you've watched my channel recently we've drawn a lot of comparisons to the dot com crash but in this video we're not going to we're not going to utilize that comparison at all we're not going to live in the past of a different business cycle and a different asset class to try to inform us as to what's going to happen within this asset class and in a completely different cycle okay i think there's merit to comparing this to the dot-com crash and i will continue to follow that but i don't want to be repetitive in the same sense that that's all we talk about so in this video we're only going to talk about the indicators specifically for bitcoin that are historical and anything that we look at today, whether it's macro related, it has to be today, right? Like it can't just be something that we look at 20 years ago and say that it has to happen again. It has to be what are the indicators today for the macro tell us, all right? So hopefully you understand the homework assignment that we're going to uh, uh, embark on right now. And we will, we will, of course, keep tabs as best as we can. I will say there is a ton of subjectivity that comes into making the case whether it's the bull or the bear a lot of the indicators that i'm going to show you might seem somewhat bullish but they also might say hey while it is pretty low it's not really as low as it normally goes okay i will try to be somewhat lenient in some cases so as to try to be fair to both sides but i'll, I'll just explain my reasoning for each indicator why i think it's either bullish or bearish and and then we will go from there okay so let's go ahead and start um and and we'll try to mix it up a little bit i i'm, I'm probably not just going to do 10 bearish ones in a row or 10 bullish ones in a row like want to mix it up a little bit uh keep you on your toes if you will so the first thing i want to do is is look at and we, we normally start with some of the more speculative ones like just looking at simple moving averages and uh, this is one of those ones that could could easily go either way depending on what your bias is and this is why it can be difficult uh, because one of the things that we've mentioned many times is that after bitcoin falls below its 50-week moving average you then see it go to the 100 week and then the 200 week right so let's take a look in history right you have august of 2014 once it went below the 50 week we then went to the 100 week and then we went to the 200 week right so check 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 2018, once we fell below the 50 week, we then went to the 100 week and then we went to the 200 week. Check, check, check. Same here again, right? You go below the 50, you go to the 100, you go to the 200. This time it went below the 200. But if you only cared about, hey, did that, did that pattern at least play out, right? Did we go to the 200? You would say, well, yeah, we did, right? That's pretty, you know, that's pretty typical for Bitcoin. And the fact that we went below it could just provide an opportunity for people right it doesn't necessarily mean that uh you know bitcoin is dead in the water so we'll give it to the bulls we'll give that perspective to the bulls and, and it is it's going to be somewhat painful i think for me uh you know to, to sort of give some of these po points away um but I, I i think as an investor you know even though of course i have a bias to some degree i mean you guys i've you know we've talked about cash is king forever uh, even though i do have a a, a bias we must try to look at things from an unbiased perspective, as hard as it could be, like as hard as it could be sometimes, we, we must. Um, now, to be fair to the bears, right? You could look at this another way and say, well, you know, that's good and all, but really one of the things to consider is that the first cycle held support at the 100 week, okay? So let me, let me get rid of all these circles um, that we just drew. And, and what we're going to say, what we're going to do here is we're going to say, well, look, the first cycle held support at the 100 week moving average, more or less, right? More or less. The second cycle held support at the 200 week. The third cycle eventually held support at guess where, right? The 300 week moving average. So you sort of have this pattern of, of the 100 week, the 200 week, the 300 week. So why not go to the 400 week this time, right? Why not? I mean, you know, if, if every time we're just going to go, we're going to drop down another major moving average, 400 weeks seems like it could, in fact, be in play. So 
that and let me get that point to the bulls that i already did so that would give you a point to the bears i think so at this point i think it's one to one right i i'd say it's one to one you get a point for the bulls and a point for the bears because it's going to be dependent on how you interpret these moving averages and, and what ultimately needs to happen all right so one to one now what I want to do is I, I want to go and look at a lot of the indicators on the website. So we're going to come back to TradingView and we're going to look at, at some more stuff. But what I really want to do is go over to the website. Again, this is uh, Into the Cryptoverse Premium. And we will take a look at a few of the different indicators, right? Is the bull market upon us or is there some more pain that needs to happen? If you look at the total crypto market cap, you'll notice that we tend to tag the lower green regression line before we go up right? It happened here. It more or less happened here. It has not yet happened this time. We historically have gone to an undervaluation with the exception of 2011, 2012. We historically have gone to an undervaluation of at least 65% undervalued, but we have not made it that undervalued just yet. So from that perspective, I think you say, well, that's a point for the bears. Um, a bull might point out that even though we went more undervalued in March of 2020, it was still a higher low for Bitcoin, but it wasn't for the for, for some assets, but it was for Bitcoin. So this is one of those that could easily be interpreted either way, but the reality of the situation is that normally the bull market does not start until we're 65% we're undervalued at least, and that has not yet happened yet. And so until that happens, I think you can make the case that it still is in fact an uphill battle. And therefore, we will give that point to the bears. All right. Continuing on, I want to look at some of the bottoming indicators that we've followed before. And this is one that is actually flipped from, from bearish to bullish. And this is the running one-year ROI. Okay. So the running one-year ROI historically bottoms at around 0.2. Okay. And we talked about this back in the last bears versus bulls case back in the summer of 2022. And one of the reasons we suggested, hey, look, we're likely going to go lower in Q4. Well, what happened? We ended up going down to a one-year ROI of approximately 0.234. Cyclically, I think you would have to give this to the bulls, right? Again, it's not based on what you want it to be. It just is based on what it is. And again, I don't control what it is. Now, the only counterpoint to this indicator that you could make is that if Bitcoin were to capitulate by late March, okay, or early April, corresponding to this sort of dead cat bounce, okay, if that were to happen, and we were to put in a future projection of, say, $10,000 by March 28th, sorry, let me fix this, so March 28th, you can see how the one-year ROI could, in fact, go closer to that 0 0.2 level, which is really where it has historically gone. So it is possible for this indicator to go lower in the short term if Bitcoin were to capitulate. Be that as it may, be that as it may, I think because there's going to be plenty we're going to give to the bears, I think you got to give this one to the bulls, okay? You know, it, because yes, that could happen, but speculating on on uh, the, the price crashing 50% in the next two weeks, well, it's certainly a possibility, right? Um, it's hard to time those exactly. And if it doesn't happen within the next couple of weeks or so, then the, the one-year ROI is likely not going to go back down to that 0.2 level because, you know, the one year sort of looking back one year, you're going to be comparing it to lower and lower prices. And it's just going to be harder and harder to, to sort of realize the one-year ROI going back to 0.2 or lower. And so that is one that I, I think has to go to the bulls. Okay. I think that one has to go to the bulls, whether you like it or not, you know, that's the point. It's, it's not, it's just whether you like it or not. Now, let me do another one for the bulls and then we'll do a couple for the bears, all right? So one of the ones for the bulls is the pie cycle bottom uh, indicator. Uh, this is not created by me. It looks like, so the pie cycle top indicator uh, was is a different one, but we're looking at the pie cycle bottom indicator and uh, you, can, you can sort of see the description beyond it if you want to. But this bottom indicator actually gave the bottom as being back in, in June, okay? Um, Clearly that wasn't the case, we went lower, but the signal flashed, right? I mean, the signal flashed, so this would be a point for the bulls. Any bear would say, well, yeah, it flashed, but it was wrong because we put in a lower low. Be that as it may, again, it doesn't matter, right? It's just, did, it, did the indicator flash or not? 
And historically, when it flashed, it meant the bottom was in. This time it flashed, it wasn't the bottom, but it thought it was. So we'll give it to the bulls. Okay. Might as well. Now let's even up the playing field here a little bit. All right, because there's plenty of reasons, you know, to to find that that would, you know, help I think help even up the playing field here. One of them is the the balance price. Now, I know that you could look at this and say, well, is it not close enough, right? Is it close enough? Historically, market cycle bottoms occur on daily closes below the balance price. The balance price is an on-chain metric, okay? It's equal to the transferred price minus the realized price. Historically, market cycle bottoms occur on daily closes below the balance price. It happened in 2011, it happened in 2015, it happened over here in 2018. It has not happened yet. I mean, we came pretty close, we wicked below it, we haven't seen any daily closes. Furthermore, normally we get multiple daily closes below the balance price before the bottom is actually in, right? It's not, or before you could reasonably argue, maybe it's the first daily close below it, but we spend some time there, historically speaking. Hasn't happened yet, right? And if you're a bull, right, if you're a bull and you want the bottom to be in, you still have to acknowledge that this indicator has this ha it has not flashed in terms of the bottom being in. Now it came pretty close, okay? But all things considered, we did not have a daily close below the balance price, and therefore that point goes to the bears. Okay? I think that's a fair assessment. I know some people are going to look at this video and disagree with me on certain points, and that's fine, right? I mean, it, it, we're all going to have our own own opinion. I'm just going to try to do the best I can. And I hope I'm being fair to both sides here, I'm trying to give some to the bulls, some to the bears, and, and, and ultimately use the information that we get to sort of form a conclusion. All right. So that was the balance price. Now, I want to look at the MBRBZ score because this is one that I think you, you have to argue could, could easily go to the bulls. Okay. Now, why is that? If you look at the MBRBZ score, right? and you look to see where it went, it went pretty low, okay? Now, you could argue that it did not go as low as last cycle, but a bull would say, well, yeah, but that one did not go as low as the cycle before that, and then that one did not go as low as the cycle before that. So all things considered, that would probably be one that you would have to give to the bulls, Another way to visualize this is to normalize it between zero and one, okay? Because it's kind of hard to tell what's going on over here and to account for some element of um, diminishing losses. And we have done just that. If we go take a look at something we have called here the MVRBZ score risk metric. So this is not the MVRBZ score. It's the risk metric of the MVRBZ score. It got pretty low, right? And it's hard, it's hard to say that that's not a point for the bulls. Now, a bear is going to come here and sit here and say, well, technically speaking, it didn't go down to that lowest level, right? Technically speaking, it did not go down to the lowest level that you would imagine it would go down to. It came pretty close, but it didn't happen, all right? In two years from now, if we look back and the bottom was in, everyone's going to look at this and say, well, wasn't that close enough, right? Like the, the risk on it was, was 0 0.02. You know, are you going to really nickel and dime us over, over 0 0.02 risk? A bear is going to say in two years, if we look back and the bottom wasn't in, we'll say, well, technically speaking, normally we go lower. So this is one of those ones that I, I think you have to give to both sides, right? I mean, I think both sides have a clear point to make. Um... And so I, I think it's worthwhile to give it to both sides just simply because you can imagine why the bulls would say one thing and the bears would say another. So we'll give that one to sort of both sides, um, both the bulls and the bears. The hash ribbons is, is one of these that, and again, we're going to include price momentum. It also has given a signal. So we have to give it to the bulls whether you like it or not. The, the sort of the counterpoint is that it also gave a signal back in, in, in August and it was wrong. And now it gave another signal back in January. Could be wrong again, right? I mean, you know, we don't talk about this one a whole lot, um, partially because back in, in the summer, I was very against the idea of June being the bottom. And I, I really did not believe this indicator 
uh, was really going to be accurate. And so I, you know, I, don't, I didn't really spend a ton of time thinking about it or talking about it. And you can see that I think that was a fair assessment. We eventually did go lower, but be that as it may, that the question is, is, has it signaled or not? It doesn't mean, you know, it's not about was it wrong or not. Um, it's just, has it signaled or not? And it, it did signal once wrong, it signaled again. So that one's gonna have to go to the bulls, all right? So it's five to four, five to four. Let's continue on, right? We got a lot of work to do here, uh, and we're only really just getting started when you when you think about it. Um, so the next one that I wanna look at is the Puel multiple. Now, this is gonna be another one that I think you could say that goes either way, because the issue here is that if you draw a line at the bottom of the page, the, the historic lows on the Puel multiple about 0.3. Look at every single cycle, 2011, 0.3, 2015, 0.3, 2018, 0.3. This time, eh, not really, right? I mean, it, it came close, but it didn't go down to that historic low. So I think I've been pretty lenient on, on some of the indicators for the bulls. So I'm going to give this one to the bears because, you know, it's possible. It's certainly possible that this marks it, but you got three clear data points here that historically have gone to 0.3, like all the way down to 0.3. And then this one, while it's gone to, it's gotten close, but not quite as far down as it occurred in every other cycle. So we're going to give that one to the bears, all right? Give that one to the bears. Now, there's other things we can look at. And one of them is in fact, um, the, the sort of the, the logarithmic regression chart. Now, this is one that I need to refit. Admittedly, I've said many times that we're going to have to refit it each cycle. Some people have said, well, why have you not refit it yet? The, the, the truth is that, you know, the, the last cycle's data was fit through April of, of 2019. And so I'd like to at least get it, get it out that far if, if possible. Um, but this is one of those ones where if you say, take the price and divide it by the non-bubble data, um, it, you know, looks something like this. So it is pretty low. Even if you were to refit this, I, I think it's going to be a fairly bullish thing. So I think you give that one to the bulls. That one's a pretty, um, pretty, you know, hand wavy type of indicator in terms of trying to call the bottom or not. Uh, so I, I, I don't think we should spend too much time dwelling on it. But that is that is at least one indicator, I guess, I suppose to consider. Now, I want to show you one. And I, I actually talked about this one not too long ago on the premium side, in fact. And, and, and it's an on-chain metric. It's the network value to transaction signal. This one is a very bearish indicator, okay? You could think about it like your price to earnings ratio, but for crypto, we don't have price to earnings for crypto. If you're not familiar with price to earnings, like if you go over here to the equity verse, we look at fundamentals, we have the, the price to earnings, the PE ratio, and you'll see what the, sort of the, the forward-looking PE ratio is and historical, um, but we don't have earn, you don't, you don't, you don't have that. In, in crypto, right? You don't have earnings. But one way that we could sort of think about this is what if we think about it not in terms of earnings, but in terms of how much the network is actually being used. And, and that way, if you do that, you're basically saying the network value to transaction ratio is equal to the market cap divided by the daily USD volume transmitted through its blockchain. Okay? What's going on? Look at the levels, right? I mean, it, it's basically at, at major peaks when we're not, you know, we're nowhere close to this mania phase over here, but it's basically at the same level. It was at its peak in 2013. So to some degree, what it, what it could be showing is that the market cap of Bitcoin was not justified at 25K based on how much the network was being used. It was more so just dubious speculation based on cyclical behavior, not because the, the, the actual um, underlying asset was being used as much. I mean, again, this is not something I, I would love for Bitcoin to be used more. It, it just is what it is. I don't control what it is. I wish I did. But you can see that it's, it's a pretty bearish indicator because normally when it spikes like this, it is marked, you know, some, uh, especially to this level, right? It is marked some, some pretty significant uh, blow off tops. Now you can also see that, you know, it, it came pretty high in these levels soon. Eventually it, it, it ultimately went down during during the bear market, but I would say this one's got to go to the bears, right? I, I think it, you know, I think you give it to the bears just because normally after it, it spikes like this, it means new lows are are eventually coming. So going, that one's going to go to the bears. The reason we do this th these videos 
is 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 not to just sort of get out of of just saying bearish or bullish you guys know my general stance has been very cautious and and cash heavy for what a year over a year now um but it, it's to try to look at things more holistically and to say you know there are reasons that people are bullish like if you're if you're a bear you should understand why some people are bullish but if you're a bull you should understand why some people are bearish and again it's not always about being right it's just about managing your risk okay i mean if you're bullish and and you can at least understand the bearish perspective then maybe you keep some cash on hand in case it goes down if you're bearish but you can at least understand the bullish perspective maybe you have a hedged portfolio where you have some bitcoin in it just in case bitcoin goes up right like just in case you get these 60% rallies, which we talked about, right? And we get akin to the dot-com crash, right? Just in case that happens. So right now it's six to six, and, and we're just gonna keep on, on moving on here. The other one is the realized network value to transaction signal. So the realized network value, this one is interesting because it, it gives a bit clearer of a signal. Look at this. When it goes up like this at the end of a um, bear market, the first peak is not usually the bottom. So, or sorry. Once the first peak occurs, it's usually the, the bottom is usually not in, right? So the first peak, we bottomed later. It was on the second peak when you looked back, the bottom was in. In 2018, right? Sort of this first peak right here, the bottom was not in on this first peak, but by the second peak, the bottom was in. So if this is the first peak, you could say, well, based on the fact that this is the first peak, the bottom's not in. But if this sort of comes back down a little bit and then rolls back up to the upside, and we get a second peak by that point, you might look back and say, all right, well, based on history, the bottom is in. So I think because it's only on its first peak and normally it does sort of get this double peak at the end of a bear market and into the recovery year, I think you give that one to the bears. The social risk is something that I've mentioned many times. Well, why do we talk about the social risk so much? Well, one reason is because it's one of the few indicators that actually predicts the secondary top in November, right? The other reason is that markets tend to bottom on apathy. They don't bottom when everyone's watching it. You know, when everyone's pulling up a chair on watching it go down, that's not usually when they bottom. That's when people don't care anymore. This is the, the social risk metric. It goes from zero to one. Low is zero risk. High, high is one risk. You can see that in 2018, it, it bottomed on apathy when no one cared anymore. Right now, you might argue there's still too many people that care, right? And the social risk consists of subscribers to crypto youtube channels viewers to crypto youtube channels analysts followers to analysts on twitter for crypto followers to exchanges on twitter and followers to layer ones on twitter and if you were to break this up into its constituents and look at the social risk and high and, and look at it in terms of the youtube subs risk it's pretty low the YouTube views risk has, has fallen off a bit. It's popped back up now, but it's because, you know, it's because some people are tuning in to see what's happening. Twitter risk is low. Exchange followers to exchanges are, is, is kind of low, but it's also in a downtrend. And you can see once it, it really needed to bottom down here back in 2018 for it to be finally over. And then layer ones is also in a downtrend. So the social risk is one of these indicators where I think it goes to the bears because you say, well, markets tend to bottom on apathy and, and people are still throwing in the towel. Okay, people are still throwing in the towel. So I think that one ultimately has to go to the bears. Let's look at the price risk. The price risk tells a somewhat different story. If this one's based on the, the Bitcoin risk metric, which we've talked about, the market cap risk metric of all of crypto, the logger and the regression chart, the market cap regression, the corridor that I made in the, in the, the fear and greed index. And when you look at it, this is what it looks like. And I think in this, in this case, you have to give it to the bulls. Because, yeah, like you could say that it has gone lower, but there was also a time in 2015 where it, it basically went to the same level that it went to this time. So I think the, the price risk goes to the bulls. The other one is the on-chain risk. The on-chain risk, I think, has to go to the bears because it has gone pretty low. But every single cycle went lower than where this one has gone. Every single prior cycle, right? Every single one. Again, a, a bull is going to look at this and say, well, it's close enough. And, and the, the, the truth is, is if, if you're a bull and you bought Bitcoin at 15K, it's probably a pretty good price in the long term, even if we put in new lows. So I, I don't really think you have too much to be worried about. But technically speaking, every prior cycle for the on-chain risk 
which consists of the MVRB Z score risk, the PL multiple, the MVRB score, the MC, so the market cap to thermo cap, the minor cap to thermo cap, the transaction fees, the terminal price. So in this case, historically it has gone lower. So I think that one has to go to the bears. Historically, right? Based on what we've historically seen. And then when you combine all of them to a total summary risk, it looks like this. And to me, this looks like it leaves something to be desired over here, right? Like to the zero risk levels, 0 to 0.1, 0 to 0.1, 0 to 0.1. This one hasn't made it there, right? It has not made it there. So I think when you combine them all, um, it, it, it goes to the bears as well. Now let's get one for the bulls. Let's find one for the bulls here. So I, I think the one for the bulls is probably just the bear market length. Typically speaking, the bear market length is going to last about a year. If you exclude the first cycle and you just look at the last two cycles, it lasted about a year. So if this one continues on like this and eventually puts in a new low, it will be the longest bear market. So if you're just assuming that this time is not different um, in, in that respect, then I, I think you just have to say, well, what if it just ended right here? You know, at a very similar time frame as the last two bear markets. Okay? So that one clearly goes to the bulls. And I, I think the bears would actually be quite understanding of that one. You know, because as much as there's reason to believe that we could go lower, and I, I think there's, there's clear evidence that, that's, that that could easily be the case, there is this element of a, a cyclical component to Bitcoin of, of it tends to bottom in November, December, January, Feb, you know, timeframes. That's when it tends to bottom. And, and this time we saw a capitulation in November, but it was not as big of a capitulation as we normally see. So I think you, you have to give it to the bulls uh, simply because cyclically it, it, it ran its course, you know, cyclically. One, another one I'd like to explore here is the, is the RSI. Now, again, compared to the dot-com crash, we know, watch the video from yesterday, that the weekly RSI can come back down here and double bottom, and that will be more indicative of a bottom. But we're not doing that. Like, we're not comparing it to the dot-com crash. We're comparing it to what Bitcoin has done. You know, we're not, we're not saying, well, this is what happened in, you know, in a, in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, we're saying this is what is happening, what, what has happened in Bitcoin in, in recent history. And if you take a look at, say, like the monthly RSI, one way that you could look at this is to say that this is some type of, um, you know, macro down, you know, macro downtrend channel and that we've already sort of tagged the lower, the lower part of this. So why do we need to, you know, why do we need to tag it again? I mean, you can see it happened in 2015, but it's hard, I think, when you look at this indicator just like this, it's hard to make a case based on this indicator alone that it's bearish right I, I mean historically when it's at these levels right like that's a pretty good time to dca into the market and this is why i continue to say you know dca is likely going to be the best strategy if you're watching this video with the idea that you're just going to waltz right in and buy whatever the bottom ends up being if, if the if the bottom's not in there's a good chance you're not going to even if bitcoin goes down to 12k 13k or 10k or whatever a lot of people aren't going to buy it because they're going to keep calling for lower prices so that's why DCA typically does tend to work out rather than trying to try to time the time the bottom. And the other thing that happens is you don't if you don't buy, if you don't ever DCA like a 15k, 16k, 17k, what happens when you get these 60% rallies that we just had where it went up to 25k? That can be very difficult for people to, to manage if they if they don't have a position at all and it could lead them into yoloing in at the next local top only to see only to see liquidity being drained out of the system once again. So I, I do think you give it to the bulls. Um, but I think you can, you know, if you look at it on, from others' perspectives, you could certainly make the case the other way. But again, you know, I, I think we have to, um, we have to keep it to, in, you know, each indicator sort of indicator specific, right? It needs to be indicator specific. And in this case, it, it goes to the bulls, right? It goes to the bulls. Let's continue on. So we did this one. We did this one. Well, we, we sort of did this one. This is sort of the risk level stuff. Um, we did the regression. We did the running ROI. We did the bear markets. The moving averages we talked about. Um, one of the ones for the moving averages, though, that I think is bearish is the fact that we have a, a weekly death cross. Okay. 
And and you know, I know a lot of people sort of don't think these are important, and they could be right. But when when this when we got death crosses for the S and P, it was pretty. It was usually um it was usually pretty bearish when you get when you get these death crosses. And normally it it meant the bottom was it's hit. Now your normal 12, 12, 12 month forward term is pretty good. But you know, a lot of times when you get death crosses, the bottom's not in, right? It can go down another 30, 20, 30, 40 percent from that time and go back to the 70s, you'll see very similar stuff from the death cross. You'll see, you'll see where how the price continued to go down. So that one, that moving average, I think is is more so one for the bears. The fact that you have this weekly death cross, it's never happened before, right? It's never happened. Um, that's something to consider. Another one to consider is um, I'm gonna go a different. Uh, let me go over here so I can pull this up without um, without changing what I have on the other one. So if you look at U.S. interest rates, not a whole lot of data for it, right? Admittedly, but what do we do know? What do we know? We know that last cycle. Bitcoin bottomed once the Fed hit the terminal rate, right? So the blue line is the is the in, U, United States interest rates, the Fed fund rate, and uh, Bitcoin bottomed here when we hit the terminal rate. And then when the, when the Fed began to ease, Bitcoin came back down, but it put in a higher low. Terminal rate has likely not been reached. Okay, you can go look at at sort of the CME group and see. That there's, you know, the expectations are that the terminal rate is is likely is likely going to be higher from where it is now. Why is that? Because inflation is still coming in fairly high, and the Fed has a job to do, right? They have a dual mandate, and one of those is to keep inflation down. Obviously, they also want maximum employment, uh, but right now, and in keeping inflation, getting inflation back down is is more uh, of an important consideration, considering we're at secular, you know, really low levels on the unemployment rate. We actually just got some new data today that it popped back up to 3.6 percent after putting in a secular low at 3.4 percent. Uh, but based on you know U.S. interest rates and seeing that last time Bitcoin bottomed when the Fed hit the terminal rate, we're likely not at the terminal rate yet. So that's a point for the bears. Another macro indicator that I, I, I think you, you, you have to um, uh, take a look at here is our, our recession risk, right? I mean, I think you have to. And if you look at the yield curve, you can see the yield curve is in fact inverted. So I can load this up. But the yield curve is inverted right now. And because of that, historically, risk assets don't bottom until, you know, after after we're already in a recession. So the yield curve is inverted. It was also inverted before the financial crisis. It was also inverted before the dot-com crash, right? And it's inverted now. So, and another way to look at this is to look at treasury yield spreads, look at the three month and the 10 year. When it gets like this, usually the only way out is via recession, which is the gray shaded region. Look at the spread on the two year and the 10 year. Normally, the only way out of this mess is via a recession. It's just a matter of time. That's what history would tell us. So from a macro perspective, I think that has to go to the bears as well, right? So the macro side of things, which arguably is a very important component, I mean, to some degree, I think you have to you have to think to yourself. Well, the you know the the Fed needs to sort of be on our side for for the market to bottom, right? And if you were to go take a look at the money supply, it's going down, right? Like the the, the money supply is is not going up, which can present an issue. Well, I mean maybe it's popped back up a little bit recently, but it's it's going it has gone down some here, okay. The reason why that's an issue is because if you take a look at, say, like the S&P divided by the, um, the money supply, you'll notice that, you know, basically we've gone sideways. Like it, it just tends to go sideways over very long periods of time. And so you could argue that asset prices go up sometimes just because there's more money circulating. And if there's more money, people got to put the money somewhere, they put it in a risk assets. Those risk assets go up and it's just part of inflation. Um, so if the money supply is going down, then that's going to provide a headwind for risk assets in general, including Bitcoin. And I think that's a point for the bears. I think that's a fair assessment, okay? 
Now, there's some other indicators that we can um, take a look at. I mean, there, there's plenty really that you could you could really look at, um, but some of the other ones. Let me try to find one that is is a little bit different than some of the ones we've previously spoken about. So, so maybe maybe the MACD is one that you could um, that we could look at. So if you were to go take a look at the at the moving average convergence divergence, the MACD, you can sort of see that it's trending back up here. And once it started to do this back over here, bottom was already in. Now the counterpoint is that this turned pink here in October, but we put in a new low in November. So even though it was, you know, even though it was moving in the right direction, we still put in a new low. Okay. So I think a, a bear would point that out, but a bull would simply say, well, it's trending in the right direction. Um, which historically has been good. And I think that's sort of a, a, a you know, sort of more like a tailwind for, for Bitcoin. So I think that one would go to the bulls. So the fear and greed index, take the raw values of the fear and greed index, clean it up a little bit by taking a, um, let's take a, a 90 day EMA. It went to some pretty low levels, right? Lower than it was at last cycle. I think you have to give that one to the bulls. I think you have to give that one to the bulls. I think a lot of you guys are familiar with the um, with the fear and greed index. Now there's a lot of on-chain indicators, more so than some of the ones we've already looked at already, but there are several different ones that we could take a look at. I, I mean, there is sort of this risk here of, of becoming a bit too redundant, and, I, and so I don't necessarily want to um, go through every single one. Here's the net unrealized profit and loss. Some of these are hard because they just tend to go higher from one cycle to another. Um, but I think you, I think I, I think a bull could look at this and, and 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 treat it as a reason to be bullish because yes, it didn't go as low as it did last cycle, but you could say the same thing for the cycle before that as well. So I, I think that one's got to go to the bulls, right? If you look at the um, if you look at the net unrealized profit and loss, and you know I'm I'm just trying to be fair to both sides here, you know where where it seems like it's 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 realistic. You know, if you look at transaction fees, I'm not really sure if this one's going to be useful in trying to uh, figure out if the bottom is in or not. But transaction fees have been going up recently, um, but you know they've gone up before, and it didn't really mean a thing in a bear market. So until you see another bubble occur, I don't really know if this is is going to be a great one to make a case either way. To be completely honest, um, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. I'm trying to remember if there were any other ones that I, I looked at because we looked at um, I know we looked at the logarithmic regression. We looked at the so there's also the logarithmic regression rainbow, which is probably one that we could pull up. So let me pull that one up. So here's the rainbow. So you could argue here. So, you know, the first and actually, I need to go to the other chart that actually has more data. So the first cycle here, um, and we're kind of down in these lower ones, the blue one, and then we were sort of at the same one here, and then we dropped down a regression band, and then we dropped down a regression band, and then if we drop down a regression band again, that means going to this lower one over here. So perhaps that one would go to the bears, but again, it's it's one of those hand wavy ones, you know. Like this is not it's not very it's not very crystal clear as to as to what direction really it should ultimately lean. But I, I think we're going to give this one to the bears just because the last two have seemingly dropped down a regression band before uh, we really geared up for another move. The counterpoint, of course, is is the fact that um, you know, we we moved to a lower regression band here, but it was actually at a higher price because it took so long to get to. But you know, at, at the way it stands right now, we tend to go down another regression band, and so it's possible that if we hit this lower regression band, it could be at a higher price than we are today if it takes a long time to get there. Um, but because it, it's a potential outcome, I, I think that one has to go to the bears. Okay. I think you can make the case either way, right? Like you could probably say either way. So maybe to be fair, you give it to both sides. You know, I, you probably because I, you know, there's a good chance that um, it, it's all going to be dependent on how you interpret. You know, do you interpret it as being more bullish? Do you interpret it as being more bearish? Um, 
So it's sort of up for, for some type of interpretation. And, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't be surprised based on how subjective all this is if at various points in, in these videos over the last year and a half, I might have interpreted them slightly differently. You know, I mean, I, I have definitely leaned on the bearish side for most things for a long time, but I, you know, I wouldn't completely put that out of the question. Um, we talked about the profit and loss. And, you know, we've we've covered a lot here. I, I think one that some some people point to is um, uh, well, well, let me go back and look at this one, because this one, if you look at the the fair value of of or based on all data, perhaps that is one that you might look at as being somewhat somewhat um, uh, bullish. Like if you take the price divided by the fair value, we're actually at pretty low levels and, and it came down to levels that were very similar to what we saw two cycles ago. So this one would probably go to the bulls. I think another one that goes to the bears is the dominance of Bitcoin. So normally, you know, one way to sort of get out all this garbage from the space is for Bitcoin to sort of eat the altcoin market alive. And I don't know that you can say that that's really happened yet. And, and recently, the Bitcoin dominance has pulled back. If you exclude stables, it's still going up. It's, you know, it's still been putting in... Um, uh, well, generally, it's just been putting in higher lows. I mean, it's up 48%, right? So, I mean, the dominance continues to sort of slowly go up when you exclude stables. But last cycle, when it finally went up a lot, the bottom was not in, actually. So, I, I think that one has to, in fact, go to the, um, uh, to the bears. Pretty even score so far. I mean, you can see there, there's a lot of reasons to sort of believe both sides. You know, there, there's cyclically, you could make the case, right? But from a macro perspective, there's certain reasons to believe it hasn't happened yet. And from sort of like a, a price drawdown perspective, you could argue that it hasn't really happened yet. Now, the counterpoint is to say, well, each cycle has some element of diminishing losses. So, this one was about a 94% move to the downside. This one was 80, 87, 86, 87. This one here was about 84. This one here so far has only been 77. Maybe that's enough, right? Maybe that's enough. The counterpoint is that we could go down to, you know, to 12K, to 10 to 12K and still be with diminishing losses. For us to go down 84% from the peak, I mean, we'd have to go like below $10,000 or so. So you still have some leeway or around that level, you still have some leeway to go to a lower price and still technically be diminishing losses when we didn't have a recession scare, right? Which is probably an important consideration to make as well. So um, I think you have to think about that too. Look, we've covered a lot um, and I don't know, you know how much more is going to be gained by continuing to sort of go down this path. Clearly you can make the case either way you know, I've, I've for a long time, my, what I've said many, many times um, is, is, you know, being cash heavy in case, especially in case the altcoin market kicks the bucket. Um, and then, you know, a portfolio that has some Bitcoin in it as a, as a hedge to, to just help with some of these rallies. And then, you know, ultimately, I think 2023 is going to be just a, a year, a choppy year, uh, to say the least a recovery year where we try to just slowly recover and find a bottom somewhere, whether it's 15K or a lower low, and then we slowly build out from it. So, I mean, I think at the end of the year, you're going to look back at this year and we're just going to say it was a recovery year. You know, maybe we put a new low, maybe we didn't, but, you know, going out in a 2024, 2025 timeframe, it's probably not going to matter too much is, is my general assessment. So, you know, probability wise, I think I'm still in the camp that like, it does seem like there's, and be, I, I think you have to understand where I'm coming from. Like I'm a fairly risk averse investor, okay? So for me, there's enough, there's enough evidence to suggest that it could go lower. So therefore I'm going to be open-minded to that potential outcome. Just like I was back in the summer when a lot of people were saying June was the bottom, right? A lot of people were calling June the bottom back then and it wasn't, right? And, you know, sort of the knee-jerk reaction to some of those videos is to say, well, you know, you're just being too bearish. But you take, you know, you, you, you look back on it and we see what happened in November of 2022. 
And the truth was that there were re there were reasons to be bearish, and ultimately a new low was realized. And so then I think you have to wonder, is that same thing going to play out again? Or are there enough bullish indicators that have, that have sort of signaled to give enough confidence to sort of the, the bulls to, to keep it from going lower than it already has? Again, just to summarize, my general assessment is that it's understandable why some people are bullish. I don't think it's worthwhile to give people who are bullish a super hard time because, again, we can see the reasons why they are. Um, on the other hand, from a macro perspective and based on some of the indicators, specifically based on Bitcoin and not even based on macro, there there would be some reason to believe that it could go lower. So if if Bitcoin goes back down to 15K, it could be a double bottom, right? Like that's a potential outcome as well. And if, if we do get a double bottom, you might actually see some of those indicators signal that didn't signal before. Uh, as crazy as that, that might sound like, you know, you could see things like the supply and profit and loss provide a signal just because there's more people that that bought all this all the you know they bought the 60 percent rally and now they're all underwater um so that's something to, to 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 keep in mind as well i do hope that this general assessment is is useful to you again the, the purpose of the video is not to tell you definitively one way or another i can tell you that compared to the video we did a year ago there's a lot more bullish indicators than there were back then when bitcoin was at 40k right so you're getting a much better deal today at at 19k than you got back over here at 39k. It doesn't mean we can't go lower, but you, you're getting a much better deal. My guess is that within the next six months or so, you're you're likely going to be out of some uh, some of these macro headwinds. You're probably going to have seen some of the other indicators flash, and therefore it will be a more obvious case for the bulls. Until that time, I think we just chop around. Uh, for a while, and then maybe by the next quarter or two quarters from now, if we still haven't put in a new low, then and we're still just sort of chopping around between 15k and 25k, then maybe by that point you just say, well, you know, there are plenty of reasons to be bearish back in Q1, but if if Bitcoin hasn't put in a new low in the next couple of quarters, you know, if it hasn't put in a new low by the end of Q3, then then maybe it's not going to, and then and then you just sort of flip back to the bull side. Um, on the other hand, if we do put in a new low, then those sort of those final indicators for Bitcoin that leave a little bit more to be desired would probably provide a signal. And then that could be enough reason. And then the only thing I think you have to worry about after that is does the macro allow for it, right? Do we go back to quantitative easing or not? Because ultimately, if I'm being completely honest, at the end of the day, the indicators are great, right? They're great. But if the Fed were to just do what it's doing forever, Right, like if they were to just keep raising interest rates and 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 rolling off assets from the balance sheet, asset prices would just keep going down. Right, the the reason why they don't just go down forever is because the, the Fed will pivot at some point. Right, I mean the money supply, uh, the also the money supply will go back up at some point, but the Fed will pivot at some point. So to some degree, until the Fed pivots, we're still fighting an uphill battle. We're still we're, we're it, it's a difficult battle. It doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't win the battle. But it's a very difficult battle to face. And therefore, as a risk averse investor like myself, I think I have to consider that, hey, we're fighting the Fed right now to assume the bottom is in. If the Fed pivots and Bitcoin hasn't gone any lower than 15.4, then I think you can make the case for it. But until you see some type of pivot or at least a pivot in sight, you're still fighting the Fed. And, you know, it's just a matter of time before you know before something happens and then they have to cut interest rate or they have to cut rates and normally when they start cutting is when you can see markets go down a lot too uh we saw bitcoin go down in march of 2020 as well and and, and they were already cutting in in late 2019 bitcoin was still going down because they start cutting once the economy is is very is very weak and they're trying to help stimulate the economy again so that's something that i think still lies in our future as well and so until we're really past some of that stuff it might be premature to get too optimistic about being the, uh, about the bottom being in fast forward a couple of quarters from now if it still hasn't happened then maybe you can start to make that case for it in the meantime i do hope this video has been useful to you if you want access to the website into the cryptoverse premium uh, just go to into the cryptoverse.com again we are running a sale right now so make sure you check it out you can lock in that rate as long as you do not cancel we do have several different tiers available. Uh, one's even a free tier, right? So if you want to just sign up for a free tier, you can do that as well. And we put out a weekly newsletter. Um, so make sure you guys check that out. Make sure you subscribe at the very least. 
and I will see you guys next time. Bye.